go about an hour. Yeah. Okay, then I'll probably be fine. I have to do the uh, 11 o'clock, so I'll be probably cool. five or ten minutes. Before. Okay, no worries. I'll introduce the contacts as being the NITP, and then you can go ahead and introduce Russ. I can't whistle. Does anybody? Hello. Hello. Hi. Um, I need you guys to settle down. Um, so um, welcome. Uh, for about a third of the people in this room are here as part of the uh, NIH-sponsored neuroimaging training program summer course. Um, and uh, we are very, very happy to be able to sponsor a couple of public lectures as part of the NITP. Um, and uh, we have keynotes uh, twice during our course. Um, 
And I also, for those of you who are not part of the course, I do want you to know that we do have a two-week-long uh, summer institute program here in advanced topics in neuroimaging. We have a website available at www.brainmapping.org slash capital N, capital I, capital T, capital P, um, in which you can watch this stuff online for the remainder of the two-week course here. Um, and it's, it's a fun course. We have a lot of great instructors. Um, and as part of the course, as I mentioned, we have two keynotes. And uh, Susan Buchheimer is here to introduce our first keynote speaker. Okay. It is my great pleasure and my great honor to introduce our first keynote of the year, Dr. Russell Poldrack, my friend and colleague. Uh, Dr. Poldrack, as um, most of you probably uh, know him, graduated from Baylor University, he did his PhD at the University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana, and then he did his postdoc at uh, Stanford with John Gabrielli. He was on faculty at um, the Harvard group, the um, MGH group, before coming to UCLA, where we were very happy to have him as a colleague for many years. Uh, he left in 2009, is that correct, to lead the, um, the imaging center at uh, University of Texas, Austin, and has moved uh, to Stanford, where he's now a, a professor. Um, most of you know Russ's work. He is a, a, a leading researcher in fMRI. He has numerous uh, awards and honors, too many to uh, list, but I will just mention that he won the Wiley Young Investigator Award at OHBM, and he's past president of the Organization for Human Brain Mapping. He also held the Wendell uh, Jeffrey Endowed Chair while at uh, UCLA. Uh, Russ has been a... Um, a very vocal um, advocate of um, excruciatingly excellent experimental design uh, in fMRI, and he's really the leader in, um, in not only trying to make sure that people can design and interpret data very well, but he's also been vocal in his um, support of excellent science and his um, disapproval of much of the pop fMRI that has gone through the media. Um, and he's been um, just an outstanding voice in favor of, of excellence in fMRI. So uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Russell Poldrack. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's fun to be back here and see all my old colleagues and friends. Um, so what I'm going to do today is kind of give a, 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 an overview of kind of where I see fMRI having come from and where I see it going. And uh, let's start with this. So this is a plot. If you go in and do a search to find uh, papers that mention fMRI in their title on PubMed, this is a cumulative plot showing how many abstracts match. So when I started my postdoc back at Stanford in 1996, uh, one could you know, reasonably sit down and read at least half of the ex extant fMRI literature in a year, right? 364 papers. Um, by the time I got to MGH in 1999, it was up to about 1,500, so you know, well beyond what any person could sit down and read, but still you know, pretty small. Um, when I started here in 2002, it was up to 4,000. Um, it's, you know, it's not stopping, right? So the question, one of the questions you might ask is, do we really know an order of magnitude more now than we did back when there were 4,000 papers? Um, and another question you might ask is, if we keep doing the same thing, we amass 40,000 more papers, will we really know twice as much as we know now? Um, and uh, I, I don't have answers for those, but I want to at least try to tell you some things that I think will, will uh, lead us to think that we need to do fMRI differently. So I'm going to talk about four different topics. The first is the concept of what we might call selective inference. Um, the second is using fMRI for prediction, which is related to selective inference. The third is looking at individual variability. And the fourth is looking at how we actually, the kinds of practices that we do in fMRI. So here's a question that you might hope we could answer. There's, if you go into um, PubMed and search for anterior cingulate and fMRI, you get almost four, you get about 3,600 papers, right? That's uh, millions of dollars spent to try to understand what the anterior cingulate does. You would hope we might have a answer to that. So let's ask, you know, how is it that most of those studies are done? And they were done using what we might call the standard neuroimaging program, or what's often called forward inference. So the idea is we manipulate something, we wiggle something in the mind, and we look at what wiggles in the brain. So we manipulate a mental process and look at how the brain changes. So for example, we show somebody a snake, and we look at what parts of the brain light up when they see the snake. Um, and then we make a forward inference. In this case, we might infer that amygdala is somehow involved in fear. So let's go back to our ACC 
and ask what are the things that cause the ACC to light up. So we can use the Neurosynth database to search and ask, you know, for a bunch of terms, what do their activation maps look like? These are activation maps for all of these terms that basically show that it seems like whatever you, whatever you wiggle, the anterior cingulate wiggles with it, right? From working memory maintenance to pain to attention to errors, difficulty to conflict. Um, and so we don't seem to have an answer given the strategy that we've been taking. And if you look at this, it's not clear that 40,000 more of these kind of papers are really going to tell us anything more about what the anterior cingulate does. Um, so in particular, you know, that kind of approach, that standard approach, it can tell us that working memory, let's say that we wiggle working memory maintenance and we see activation of the cingulate. It tells us that working memory is sufficient to activate that area. It doesn't tell us that the area is necessary for working memory or that working memory is necessary to activate the area. So it tells us something, but maybe not exactly what we want to know. So what are the alternatives here? Um, so it could be that there's some confound underlying all of this. So for example, um, people breathe more or have the autonomic activity when they do a task, right? Um, and that's driving ACC. We know ACC is involved in interoception. Um, it could well be that there's di distinct subsets of neurons in the ACC that do all these different things. There's a pain column and a working memory maintenance column. Alternatively, it could be that those are all things that the ACC does in the context of other areas. So when it's talking to dorsolateral prefrontal, it's doing maintenance. When it's talking to insula, it's doing pain and so on. Um, or it could be that we're just chopping things up wrong, that these aren't all distinct functions in the, the head that, map, that should map onto brain systems. Another way of saying that is it, it, it's not clear that any of those is a thing that a brain area could do. And I have a thought experiment that I, Dan Bob did this thought experiment a long time ago, and so I've just revived it, which is what if the phrenologist had fMRI, right? So everybody, most of you are familiar with phrenology. They took these sort of mental faculties, things like love and suavity and phyloprogenitiveness, and said that, you know, they were associated with bumps on the head. Now, they got the, the whole skull part wrong. Um, but we also now think they got the psychology wrong. Like none of us thinks that suavity is a... A fundamental psychological process. But you can imagine that if there was a, you know, somebody in a phrenology lab that got their hands on fMRI and they were like the suavity lab, right? They would go do an experiment where they would show people pictures of suave people and pictures of unsuave people and they would find activation and publish their paper in Nature on the neural basis of suavity, right? Um, that would not tell us that suavity is a real thing in the head, right? And none of us doubts that people would find activation for suavity if you did the experiment, right? Um, so, so let's ask how else we might try to understand what the brain is doing. And one way to think about this is in terms of what we've called reverse inference, the idea that, you know, looking at sort of what we can predict from activation in the head. So the way that reverse inference goes is we see activation in some area and we try to predict what psychological process is going on. So, for example, we see activation in the amygdala and we think we want to predict that the person's experiencing fear. Um, and this is a way of using fMRI that is very common in the New York Times uh, op-ed pages. Uh, this is one from a few years ago where this self-styled neuromarketer, Martin Lindstrom, put a bunch of people in a scanner and working with this neuromarketing company and looked at uh, what lights up when they saw pictures of their iPhone buzzing. And he basically wanted to claim that Subjects' brains respond to the sound of their phones as they would respond to the presence or proximity of girlfriend, boyfriend, or family member. In short, the subjects didn't demonstrate the classic brain-based signs of addiction. Instead, they loved their iPhone. And this is because of this flurry of activation in the insular cortex of the brain. Anybody who knows about addiction in the insula knows that addiction is actually, you know, tightly associated with the insula. Um, but, uh, but the more general point here is that, you know, this type of inference is fundamentally flawed, at least the way it's being done here, because activation in the insula doesn't necessarily tell you the person's experiencing love. Um, and so we wrote an op-ed, uh, or, or sorry, a letter to the editor about that op-ed that was published uh, a few years ago. Um, so, I mean, it could well be that reverse inference could work, right? If love was the only thing that turned on the insula, then seeing insula activation would tell you the person's experiencing love. But in fact, we know that lots of things turn on the insula, like effort, like pain. Um, and in fact, the insula moves along with the anterior cingulate in being activated in a ton of studies. This is a, an analysis showing um, from our paper a few years ago uh, with Talia Arconi, basically showing overall activation across all of the then 4,000 or so studies in the Neurosynth database. The point being that um, 
these areas are active in like a quarter of all studies. So seeing activation in them doesn't really tell you much at all about what's going on. And so I published a paper when I was here back in 2006 that sort of laid out the problems with reverse inference um, and um, it has been taken by some to basically say you can never do reverse inference. The point of the paper was reverse inference is a potentially problematic kind of inference and it turns out there are ways to do it better. Um, and those ways to do it better come from the field that's come to be known as machine learning, pattern recognition, statistical learning. These are a few of the textbooks from that field that sort of lay out the idea. And this has become a really powerful method in neuroimaging for trying to basically decode from brain activity what the person is doing. Um, and so the idea is you take a data set, you train a statistical machine on part of that data set, and then you use a held out part of the data set to actually test the machine to say, how accurately can we predict, for example, whether the person's experiencing fear? Um, and you could do it using a small part of the brain, you could do it using um, activity across the whole brain. Um, here's just an example to show you how well this can work. Um, this is using the data from the Human Connectome Project. So they had people do a broad set of different tasks and then they had, which within each of those tasks, and I'll show you examples in a moment, within each of those tasks, they had different contrasts, um, a total of 47 different contrasts across the, I think, seven tasks. And then they have 465 people. So what we did, um, this is work from uh, Vanessa Socket in my lab, um, we basically would pull out two groups of subjects, um, and we, you have to, because there was relatedness in that sample, because they had twins, you have to pull out two sets of unrelated people. So we pull out two sets of 47 unrelated people, um, sorry, two sets of, 46 unrelated people, and then each person has 47 of those uh, contrasts. And then we basically, for each contrast, ask how similar is it, you know, take contrast A for subjects in this group and ask in the other group, how similar is that contrast to all the contrasts in the other set of people? And whichever one it's most similar to, you just classify it as, you know, them having done that. So it's, a, it's basically a, kind of like a, a correlation-based uh, classifier. And it turns out for more than half of the task contrast in the HCP data, you can perfectly classify them. You can basically get it 100% right. And interestingly, the ones, so this is accuracy in, for each of these is a different contrast. And um, interestingly, the ones out here that you do worst on are all on the working memory task, which sort of fits with the idea that, you know, working memory is probably something that's kind of spanning across a lot of these. So you actually make some confusions there. Um, so this says that, you know, we can actually do, if we do it the right way, we can do some kind of decoding, at least in, you know, across 47 different alternatives to say, what is this person doing? Um, but what we really care about is not like what task was, you know, Martin Lindstrom didn't care that the person was doing the task of looking at their iPhone. He cared about whether they're experiencing love. And so what we really care about is decoding psychological functions rather than tasks. And there's some work that's starting to do this. Um, uh, da, 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 da. This is some work uh, that we've done in collaboration with uh, Gaël Varquois and Bertrand Thirion in Paris, um, doing what we call ontology-based decoding, where in basically what we do is we use an ontology that describes different aspects of task. In this case, it's like, what is the stimulus? What is the response? And so each task gets coded by, you know, all of those different features. And then we train classifiers not to learn what particular co task contrast was the person doing, but to learn what features are present. Um, and it turns out that we can do, um, this is uh, precision and recall over here. So, you know, for many of them, we're out at about 0.8. Um, so we're actually doing pretty well at classifying a lot of these. Now, this is, this is still not getting exactly where we want because this is features of the task rather than kind of psychological functions. Um, I'm going to skip this next thing. Um, but we've also started to look at whether we can decode psychological functions from tasks. So we've developed a... Uh, an ontology called the Cognitive Atlas that's meant to describe, you know, all of the different things that are in the mind. Things like response inhibition and reward and stimulus-driven attention and so on. So we took a data set from OpenFMRI, which is a data sharing project that we've run for the last few years, and asked basically for each, you know, we coded each task contrast in that data set in terms of what psychological functions do we think are being engaged? Are they engaging speech or mentalizing or memory encoding and so on? Um, and then we, we train a classifier not to say, you know, which of those, you know, some number of tasks, and there are 20-something tasks, not which of those tasks are they doing, but 
which psychological processes are turned on. And each task might have multiple processes turned on. So it's what we call a multi-label classification problem. And then we take a new data set and now say, can we predict which psychological functions were turned on? And it turns out that we can uh, better than chance for a lot of them. For things like uh, vision and action execution and decision making, we do pretty well. The, the rarer the process gets in the data set, the harder it is to do it. So the ones down at the bottom here are the ones that didn't really have very many examples in the data set, so we can't do very well. Um, and so this is one of the reasons why we're pushing for kind of larger shared data sets to be able to ask these kind of questions on a larger scale, where we have multiple data sets that tap into each of those different processes. Okay, so this says we can predict something from imaging data. Um, and there's been a lot of talk about kind of pushing prediction out into the real world. Um, so the kinds of things you might want to ask are, can you predict whether somebody's going to get a particular disorder? Or whether a particular drug is going to be the most useful drug for a person with a disorder? Or whether a person's going to go commit another crime when they get out of jail? Or whether a person has terrorist intent when they show up at the airport? Um, and so it's useful to think about what we mean when we use the word prediction. Because in the neuroimaging literature, we have a dysfunctional relationship with the concept of prediction. Um, <laughs> So I just did a search a few months ago and found a bunch of papers that match the word predict in the title and fMRI. And you find 96 papers. And if you go look at them, what they generally mean by prediction is something like correlation. So this paper says, uh, you know, they say uh, in increases in functional connectivity predict individual differences in memory accuracy. What they really mean is that they're correlated, right, in the, within the data set. Um, Sometimes you often see it used in the context of like prospective correlations. The idea is we measure something at time point one, and then we assess its correlation with something else at time point two. Um, and so here they use you know, imaging to pre predict um, uh, outcomes from surgery. Again, looking at correlation, but now across time points. The problem with all of this is, and it's been known in statistics for a long time, that when you take a data set and compute a correlation, that correlation almost necessarily overestimates how well you're going to be able to predict to something new, to a, to a data point that was not, that's from the same population, but was not part of your sample. And the point is that you're using the data twice. You're using the data both to fit the model and to test the model. Um, and so that's why you, you basically get an, optimi an overly optimistic picture of how good your prediction is. So um, the way to deal with this is, again, through our, our old friend cross-validation, where we take part of the data set train the model, and then test its performance on a part of the data set that we held out. Now, ultimately, you'd really like to go collect a whole new data set, but often that's not <coughs> possible. Um, and so let me show you an example of how this can sort of go wrong. So many of you may have seen this paper a few years ago uh, by Kent Keel's group uh, titled Neuro Prediction of Future Rearrest. So it's this amazing study where they took people coming out of jail, scanned them right away on a go, no go task, um, and looked at anterior cingulate activation while they did the go no go task. And then try to see if that's associated with uh, whether they went back to jail or not over the next four years. And these are the survival curves. So basically, the green line is the people who had high ACC response shows that you know, by the end of four years, something like 30% of them, 30 something percent had gone back to jail, whereas the people with low ACC response, something like 60% of them had gone back to jail. And that, you know, you look at that and you're like, wow, we can really predict with some degree of accuracy whether a person's gonna go back to jail or not. The problem is that this predictive accuracy is based on the same sample that it was that the model was fit on. So uh, Jeanette Mumford and I did an analysis. So fortunately, they were nice enough to actually make their data available with the paper. So we could take the data and reanalyze them using a proper cross-validation approach, which turns out to be tricky for these kind of survival data. But, um, but Jeanette implemented this model. So basically what you see here is this is the prediction error. This is how, how, how wrong we get our predictions. And part of the point is, you know, we know on average the jail, or at least we're, you know, actually probably more than that. But you know, we're basically, if we just predict that's, you know, what we know on that basis, we can do pretty well. And we can do a little bit better if we put the person's age into the, uh, the equation. The question is, how much better do we do if we also put in brain activity? So the black line here is the line that's basically not knowing anything about their brain, just knowing that they were in jail and I think their age. The green line is that prediction error, so how badly are we doing, if we also add in the, um, the brain activity. And you see it gets a little bit better, right? Our predictive, predictive accuracy goes up by, um, if we integrate across that whole time, it goes up by a few percent. So it's not as if it's not predictive, but if you saw this, you probably wouldn't go write a 
PNAS paper titled Neuro Prediction of Future Rearrest, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so the, the point is that, you, that you, know, the, the, you can see really striking differences between in-sample correlation and out-sample prediction. Um, another place where, this, you know, where there's interesting um, sort of misuse, I think, of the concept of prediction is, has to do with diagnosis of disorders, which has become a really common thing in the literature. So here's a paper from a few years ago that you know, said we can, using MEG, we can successfully differentiate PTSD patients from healthy control subjects. And these might be able to be used for differential diagnosis, right? But this reflects kind of a fundamental misconception about uh, what this tells you. So the fact that you can differentiate a healthy individual from a sick individual doesn't really tell you anything about whether you can differentiate different types of sick individuals. And I always like to go back to Bob Builder's concept of brain schmutz as sort of like the, the null hypothesis that you know, all these disorders are caused by some kind of global brain schmutz. <laughs> Um, and, uh, and, you know, that's, that's what we have to work from. Um, there's an interesting cautionary tale that came out of a, paper, a study that was done a couple years ago. This was this thing called ADHD 200, where they, it was a contest that was done. They put out uh, uh, data in 2011, about 700 subjects, 491 controls, 295 with ADHD, and the goal was to predict, to decode whether the person has ADHD and what type, what subtype. So you have this initial training data, you build your classifiers, and then you're given a set of 197 unlabeled data sets. You're supposed to take those data sets, run them through your tool, and then um, you know, send your predictions into the contest. And they looked at basically how well people did. And it turned out that people did OK. So if you do like a, an RSC, uh, you see that. So um, the winner on that global measure of accuracy was this group from University of Alberta. Um, they got 64% accuracy. And what's really interesting is how they did that. They didn't use the imaging data at all. <laughs> um, they only used age, sex, handedness, and IQ, and it turned out that there were confounds in the data set with those variables and ADHD diagnosis, not surprisingly. Um, and uh, it, this brings into question almost every study that's done of this kind of like disease diagnosis, right? Because it basically says, you're, you, it may well be that you can decode diagnosis using brain imaging, but you might be decoding it based on other things than you think you're decoding it on, um, like age or sex or something like that. Um, so I want to go further and, and argue that decoding DSM diagnoses in general is a fool's errand. Um, and you know, there's increasing evidence that these things don't really reflect biological categories. So recent work from Amit Etkin's lab at Stanford showed basically that if you look at structural imaging, you see that you know, pretty much all the different neuropsychiatric diagnoses show deficits in structural imaging, but the, the commonalities amongst those disorders are much greater than the differences between them. And a similar study comes out of the psychiatric genetics liter literature, where you see you know, big overlap in the genetic underpinnings of these different disorders. I want to make another argument to segue into the question of individual variability, which is that psychiatric disease is not a steady state. So these are data for a couple of individual schizophrenic patients uh, from Cooper and Hoffman. And ba basically, this is just a measure of their kind of daily functional living level. So if you're up in the green, you're kind of doing OK. You're, you can probably get by. If you're in the middle, you're not doing so well. If you're down at the bottom, you're incapacitated. right? You're not going to be able to go kind of lead your daily life. And what's really striking is how an individual can go from being completely incapacitated to pretty much completely normal within the course of a few weeks, right? So taking, the, giving this person the label of schizophrenia sort of overlooks the fact that their brain is presumably showing big differences over the course of those weeks. Um, and if you want to understand those differences, presumably you need to understand how a healthy human brain changes over that same time course. Um, but if you ask, what do we know about uh, how healthy individual brains change over the course of weeks and months? There's basically nothing. Well, until last week, there was nothing. Um, and so last week, we published the first paper from the Myconectome Project. Um, and so when I started thinking about this question, I mean, the question was really kind of you know, driven into me back when I was here, um, hanging out with, you know, with people over in NPI. And uh, I had been thinking about it for a while. And a couple of interesting influences drove me to decide to do this. One is an artist friend who basically does art based on data that she collects about herself, a big sort of quantified self person. Um, and another was a study by Mike Snyder from Stanford where he did something similar to himself just using blood measurements over the course of a year and a half. 
So I decided basically to start getting in the scanner multiple times a week. Um, for started out with a goal of doing it for a year, ended up doing it for about 18 months, and ended up getting scanned 105 times. Um, the paper that we just published had 84 kind of usable data sets. Um, we also took blood, did behavioral measurements. Um, the blood we did RNA sequencing, we did metabolomics. I'm not really going to talk about those today. Um, but this is all the measurements that we did, just to show you that you know, it wasn't stable. It wasn't sort of constant over time. There were a couple of breaks for various reasons. Um, but we did a lot of measurements on one person. And obviously, it's limited by the fact that it's on one person. Um, so take it with a big grain of salt. So let's start by asking, like, what does brain connectivity look like just in the resting state uh, in a person when you've measured them really well? So I worked with Steve Peterson's group. They have these methods for doing what they call surface-based parcellation. So the idea is you take all the resting state data, put them on the cortical surface, and then at each spot, you basically ask, how is this spot correlated with everything else around it? And you find sort of places where those connectivity patterns change drastically. And you basically put lines there. So we call that parcellation. Um, they've done this before on group data. Basically, what we did here was treat me as a group of 84 sessions. Um, and so uh, what we see is when we do this on me, you get things that look similar to what has been seen in groups before, but there's also some interesting differences. Um, so for example, uh, you know, I have spots down here. This should all be in, in the group. This is just all red, all part of the default mode network, but I have some spots that are part of Stanley's network. Spots are part of frontal parietal network. And we've, I mean, these are very highly reliable. So we've done it on, you know, subsets of the data and see that the parcellations are very similar. If you just take, this is done on all 84 sessions and the, you know, the, the, the stability of the correlation estimates here is really high. So we have faith in that these are, you know, telling us something real about connectivity, um, suggesting that, you know, we may want to start looking at, at individuals more closely. Uh, the black, yeah, that's a really interesting question. Uh, we have no idea. Um, it's 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 uh, presumably the saying that I'm not as good at uh, mind wandering as I uh, as I should be. Um, so, you know, the reason that we started doing this was to ask how does an individual varying over time compare to differences between individuals? Because if if individual variability over time looks just like individual variability across people, then there's no need to bring people in multiple times and scan them. Um, turns out that it looks very different. So on the right are data um, from a cohort at WashU, uh, 120 subjects, showing um, this is just the whole connectivity matrix up here. Um, and then um, you know, this is a map showing which regions are most variable in their connectivity. And you see that it's largely these kind of lateral frontal parietal regions uh, and then medial frontal and parietal regions. Whereas if you look at me, it's almost the inverse, right? That the most variable regions within me across time in their connectivity are primary regions like visual and uh, somatomotor regions. Um, so it suggests that you really can't just look at groups and infer from that what individual variability is going to look like. Um, one of the interesting things we found came out of the fact that I, so I got scanned Tuesday, Thursday mornings at 7.30 a.m. Tuesdays I was fasted and had not had caffeine because I had to have a blood draw afterwards. Thursdays I was fed and caffeinated. So we have an interesting experiment there. Time of day is the same otherwise. Um, turns out that that effect drives big differences in connectivity, probably not surprising. Um, but interestingly, it drives them primarily in these kind of more uh, uh, primary regions. And it, you might have, I think the, the null hypothesis going into it was connectivity is just going to go down when you're uncaffeinated. Turns out that in the primary regions, connectivity goes up. Somatosensory and visual regions, you see more connectivity. And interestingly, it changes the entire structure of the network. So what we've done here is taken each of these dots is one of those 620 parcels across my brain. We've done a standard sort of you know, spring embedded network analysis based on the correlation. So a line between two things says that they have a correlation that's in the top, I think it's 1% of all correlations. Um, and what you see is, unsurprisingly, these, the, the nodes kind of break up into networks. So you have, um, up here, you have the default mode network, frontal parietal network, singular percular network. This is the somatomotor network. This is the sec sort of higher visual network. And the, the, um, the dots here are marked with either circles or triangles to reflect the fact that they are hubs. But hub basically means, a, a, a node that's highly connected to other nodes more than one would expect. 
Um, and um, a provincial hub is one that's connected mostly to things like in its local network. Connector hub is something that's connected to stuff in other networks. Um, what's really interesting is you'll notice that the, on Tuesdays, the semi motor network and the secondary visual network are really tightly coupled together and have a lot of hubs. On Thursdays, somatomotor network now you know goes from having more than 10 hubs to having one, and it's kind of Un, it's become uncorrelated pretty much with that secondary visual network. So this is suggesting that caffeine isn't just turning things up you know, overall, it's really changing network structure in a really interesting way that we don't understand. So we also looked at, um, at sort of connectivity changes over time, and we had to boil the numbers down in order to be able to actually get our head around them. Um, and so what we did was um, within each of these 12 global networks, we computed either the mean within network functional connectivity, so within all the visual regions, how, on average, how connected are they, or between network connectivity, so between all visual regions and all somatomotor regions, what's the, the mean connectivity? And then we use those numbers to look at over time. So here's a admittedly not great slide um, that shows each row here is one of those networks and each column is a time point. Um, and the thing to notice are these little markers out here, which basically say that there's either linear or polynomial trends over the course of a year and a half in those areas. So basically, the secondary visual network shows this long increase in connectivity over the course of a year and a half. And then these four, V1, dorsal attention, ventral attention, and somatomotor, show this interesting polynomial trend. And again, you know, it's hard to know whether this is just something weird that was going on with me you know, we only did it for one, basically a year and a half, so we don't have a full set of seasons to get it, to get it, you know, seasonal effects. Really hard to know what's driving it, but it suggests that there are these interesting, very long-term changes that may be going on. Um, and obviously, we, you know, we'd love to um, to follow up on this. Um, I don't know. I'm not sure my lab is going to follow up on it, but there's a couple other labs right now that are gearing up to do this kind of intensive longitudinal imaging on individuals. So I think that you know in the next few years we'll start to see a lot more data. Now the the final thing that we did was to um, to kind of take all of our different variables and put them together into this big mess that we call phenome wide uh, network analysis. So the idea is we did we did on the order of 38,000 uh, t tests. And we take the ones that survive, in this case it was, I think, uh, survive at a false discovery rate less than 0.01. And they could be you know, between different types of variables. So this is basically saying that there's a correlation between, sorry, let me use my mouse here. There's a correlation between connectivity in the frontal parietal network and um, the prevalence of metabolites related to fatty acid transport from my blood. Or there's a relationship between fatigue and positive mood and Tuesday versus Thursday, and activation in dorsal attention and somatomotor networks, right? So you see that we can start to, to kind of make sense, not just of you know, what's sort of changing simply over time, but how do these different types of variables move together? None of this really gives us you know, any insight into these particular types of processes, I think, because it's just one person. We don't know if, if it's an accident of what was going on with me, if it's a false positive. Um, but nonetheless, it, it drives a bunch of hypotheses that one can now go test. So for example, we can go test, you know, if we manipulate uh, caffeine, you know, over time, do we see differences in these different areas? Um, and, you know, most interestingly are all the relationships between metabolic variables, either gene expression, which, so for example, um, uh, let's see where, so the gene expression things are down here, um, many of which interestingly were related to, I have psoriasis and I tracked that, they were related to that, unsurprisingly. Um, but you particularly see there's a bunch of um, uh, metabolomic variables, so this is measuring metabolites in my blood that are related to, to brain activation. And we don't have any way of understanding that at all right now. So um, one of the things that, as I was doing this, you know, this is a huge data analysis. The raw data themselves are about four terabytes. Um, and, you know, we, we spent about a year analyzing these data. And, you know, you can, you can get very worried about how much kind of, you know, messing with the data we did. Um, and I was very worried about that going into it and remain worried. So one of the things that we tried to do was to build a completely automated analysis workflow, in part because, you know, I had to go back and redo things a few times. The wash you guys would give me a new parcellation. I had to rerun all of my analyses. And you know, doing that all 
by hand is both error ridden and a real pain in the ass. And so um, I decided to build a, a system that could basically, you know, given the data, now some of the processing had to go on on the supercomputer, but this, basically taking the pre-processed data from the supercomputer, which is like, you know, all of the, the time courses of connectivity and metabolomics and behavior, put those into what became a, what we call virtual machine, and it does all the, the processing. So if you actually go to this GitHub page, you can download this thing called MyConnectome VM and install a couple of other packages, and then it will basically go run all of the analyses that are in the paper, um, and it takes about probably four or five hours. Um, and then it'll pop up a browser that lets you basically look through all of the data. So if you wanna see the RNA sequencing QA results, you can, uh, sorry, you can see that. If you wanna you know, look at the individual time courses for each of, the, um, for each of those uh, variables, you can do that. Um, you can sort uh, and sort of explore the data in any way you want and download them. Um, and so you might ask, why bother? Why would we go to all the work of kind of you know, doing this, this crazy, it took me about a month of a lot of you know, messing to get that virtual machine going such that I could really click a button and it'll grab all the data and do all the analyses. Um, and why bother kind of segment, segues into the, the last part of the talk, um, which is, I mean, you, you cannot have, have you know, been listening for the last couple of years without walking away with a sense that science is in crisis. Right. I mean, I didn't put the, eco the Economist cover on here, but they had a cover story a couple years ago about you know science going wrong, um, and you know a lot of it has been centered around particular areas in psychology. Um, but you know we know that in neuroimaging, a few years ago, we had a big kerfuffle about the degree to which some of the practices we were using for ROI analysis may have been problematic. Um, it's not. Uh, unique to us. You see it in cancer research. In fact, John Ioannidis, my colleague at Stanford, has argued that because of the way that we do statistical testing, we are guaranteed to, um, to have most of our findings be false. Um, and so what I want to do is talk about a few of the things that contribute to that and how we might think about dealing with them. And the first is power. So um, this is a, a nice paper by uh, Button and colleagues from a couple years ago called Power Failure that basically went through a bunch of papers from the neuroscience literature, both uh, structural imaging papers and uh, rodent behavioral neuroscience like lesion studies, and just quantified the statistical power of those studies. And what they saw was that the large majority of them were um, underpowered by our standard 0.8 criterion, and many of them were really underpowered. You know, the, the mode here is power of less than 10%, okay? Well, now, why is that a problem? You might say, well, low power prevents you from finding effects if they're there, right? Why is that a problem? It turns out that, and this is the crux of the Ioannidis 2005 paper, that low power also ensures that the, pro that the proportion of the findings that you do find that are false is inflated. And that's what this curve shows, basically. It's looking at what's called the positive predictive value, and basically it, it says that, you know, let's just hold our pre-study odds constant. If you have 80% uh, power, then, you know, with this 0.5 odds, you have 80% likelihood of any finding that you find being a true finding. That goes down to less than 50% when your power is low. Because you know you're you're going to keep finding the same number of false positives. You're controlling the false positive rate, right? You're doing 10,000 tests. You're controlling the number of those that will come out significant. But what's going down is the number of true things that you're going to find that mix in with that, right? So the proportion of false to true is higher when your power is lower. Um, and the um, when you estimate the effect size, you want to say how big is that effect that I'm seeing? You end up greatly overestimating your effect size, this is called the winner's curse, when your power is low. And this is a point that was actually made similarly by Tal Yarconi in a paper about correlations in fMRI analysis a few years ago. That basically when you have small samples, the only things you're gonna find are gonna be really big effects and so you're necessarily gonna overestimate the size of the effect. Uh, another threat to reproducibility is how flexible our analysis packages are. You know, those of you who are in the course are gonna hear a ton this week about many different ways to analyze data. Um, and um, you're gonna wanna go home and try them all, right? And so I just sat down as a thought experiment and looked through kind of the standard FSL options and chose things that nobody would, you know, alternatives at each of the, say, six or eight steps that nobody would say are crazy, 
and you can come up easily with more than 5,000 possible analysis workflows. Now, um, Josh Karp actually you know, did something like this in his paper uh, a couple years ago, um, where he looked across 6,000 pipelines estimated on a data set from OpenFMRI and showed that, you know,
want to continue funding our research if they think that it's all false, right? So I think we need to focus on that, and then you know everything else hopefully will fall in line. And I, I like to finish these kinds of lectures with this quote from Feynman. The first principle is that you must not fool yourself, and you are the easiest person to fool. Um, so uh, thanks very much. So, as a pro, Russ, of course, has left a couple minutes for questions, which is really great. Um, there's just two things I really want to say before we do this. One is to, um, for those of you who are part of the course, I want to very specially acknowledge, I should have done this before Russ got up, his major role in actually creating the course. He was the course director for, I think, four years um, with that, and it's a fabulous thing. Um, and the other thing is for the people in the audience, Russ has very generously offered to share his slides. They are up on the web. So for those of you who are busy with your cell phones, you can probably throw away all those pictures. Okay, uh, please. Questions, yeah.